We've got to get into the Word of God, yeah? yeah? That's what we hear about. I want to look at another look at following Jesus today. I know you've been doing a series on knowing Jesus, yeah. loving Jesus, and showing Jesus. I think this will fit in with that series. I hope it does. Revelation 5, going right... Yeah, let's go right to the book of Revelation, yeah? Chapter 5, verse 1. Are we ready for the Word of God this morning? Anyone got a Bible? Does anyone bring Bibles to church anymore? Or iPhones? How do I know you're actually looking at the Bible when you've got your iPhone out? You could be on Facebook. Trust. Okay. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. John says, Then I saw, then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion. Everyone say lion. lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Don't worry, I'm not going to get into end time stuff. Verse 6. Then I saw a, what does it say? Lion? Lamb. Interesting. Looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Let's just put a pause there for a moment. Think about this. At the centre of real power, at the centre of the throne of the universe, how is that power described? A lion, but also a lamb. Think about that. That's what holds this whole universe together. Someone who's as powerful as a lion and as meek as a lamb. That's got big implications for where I'm going to go, but just hold on to that. When our kids were small, many years ago, we used to read, from, read to them from the Chronicles of Narnia. Well, in that intellectual C.S. Lewis, who wrote those children fantasy stories, and now they've been made into films. Have anyone seen The Prince of Caspian and all that? They're brilliant stuff. Anyway, uh, one of the children called Lucy, uh, in one of, the, one of the books, expressed concern about meeting this mythical creature called Aslan the Lion. Does anyone remember this? Aslan the lion, and he's the kind of the Christ figure in these mystical, mythical kind of stories. And she asks this question. She says, is he safe? Is he safe? And she was told in no uncertain terms, safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's good. You know, in the scripture that we just read, there were two pictures here, two metaphors that describe Jesus. He's given the title the Lion of the tribe of Judah and also a lamb that had been slain. And they describe his character. They give us a picture of what his nature is like. And from this scripture, as a bit of a foundation this morning, I want to share with you the secret on how to live successfully in every area of life. Have I got your attention now? That's a big claim, isn't it? Does anyone know what that secret is? Do you want to stop the clock, phone a friend? <laughs> to do that, we're going to have to go to another passage in the Gospel of John. And I want to look at verse 14 and 17 of the Gospel of John. Same guy that wrote the book of Revelation, I believe. John chapter 1, verse 14, says, The Word, he's talking about Jesus, given the title The Word, became flesh, in other words, became a human being, and made his dwelling among us, lived in our human culture and our world. It says, We have seen his glory, we've seen his fame, we've seen, uh, you know, what he's like, and the glory of the one and only, or the one and only begotten, you know, this... This word made flesh, this human being was the one and only Son of God who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Can you say that with me this morning? Grace and truth. John testified concerning him and cries out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one's ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side or the only begotten Son who is at the Father's side has made him known. Grace and truth. 
grace and truth. That's what I want to focus in on today. The lion and the lamb, grace and truth. Let me just explain a little bit about what grace means. Just a simple definition. It just means ability or power or an unearned gift that you might have. You know when someone says, oh, she's got such grace, she's such a graceful dancer. What does that mean? That they've just got this innate gift, this incredible ability that they didn't deserve. Or when someone says, look, they were so gracious to me, like if I said John and Deb were so gracious to me, it's just like they gave me undeserved favour. They just treated me so well, I didn't deserve it. It's gracious, it's grace. See, the law is the stark principles of what's right, you know. I mean, the law is good, it's holy. A lot of people think the law is bad because it's in the old... No, no, the law is good. I mean, it's, you know, it's still good not to steal, yeah? It's still, still good not to, you know, commit adultery. It's still good to, you know, to tell the truth. Yeah. So the law is, is good. The only problem is it doesn't give you the power and the strength to be able to do good. It kind of kills you, it nails you, you know. But grace and truth embody the principles of the law in a human being, in a person. It, it embodies the principle of the law and give it life and give it power and give it context. So that's what grace is. Truth, truth is it's everything that's in the Bible, obviously, but it's more than what's in the Bible. Have you ever heard the phrase, well, theologians like to throw this one around, all truth is God's truth. Has anyone ever heard that? All truth is God, not just the Bible, but scientific facts is truth. Discoveries in creation is truth. The laws of the universe is truth. Principles in nature, there's truth in law and philosophy and art and economics and medicine and quantum physics and astronomy and in all creation. There's truth in those things and they all belong to Jesus Christ, who's the ultimate truth. God speaks to us. Not just through the Bible, but he speaks to us through creation. Psalm 19, which we'll see on the screen here in verse 1 to 4, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. They're speaking, it says. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. In other words... All over the world, no matter what tribe, no matter what country you're in, no matter if you're in the you know, most remote jungle area, the skies are proclaiming and speaking about the reality of God to you. And they've been doing this for millennia. No matter where you are, not what, no matter what language is, there's this universal revelation that God is real and that he's here and he's amazing. It says, their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Just recently, I was holidaying in a place called Phillip Island, and, and it's just, it's a beautiful place. It was cold, very cold. That's why I got a bit of a cold. But it was a, we were down this beautiful, rugged surf beach down there, and it was just a fantastic time just to get away from the phone and the internet and, you know, people and all that kind of stuff. But also, you're away from all the city lights, all the light pollution. And so we were looking up at the stars at night, and you could see the Milky Way, you could see so many stars that you don't normally see. There were just billions of them. And I'm thinking each one of those stars is a sun, and around those suns are planets. I mean, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. And it was just so clear that the skies were speaking about the glory of God, this incredible universe that we're a part of, that he's real, that he's full of incredible knowledge. And you see, God doesn't just speak through the Bible. He speaks through creation to everyone. There's not one person on the face of the earth that hasn't had God speak to them. That's great. And, um, you know, um, he doesn't just speak through the Bible. God speaks in all kinds of ways. I've been, the last few years, I've been having some unnerving experiences. You know how God speaks to you and it's not nice and it's really kind of, gentle and comforting. I've been having some unnerving, I don't know how else to put unnerving experiences. It started off when I just started walking in down the inner city area of Melbourne and I would see a homeless person or I'd see a, someone who's a, like a busker trying to earn some money or, and 
one day I was walking past someone and I just heard this voice say, hey, there was no one speaking, but I just heard, hey, I'm over here. And it just hit me. And it was the Lord speaking to me, showing me something, that he was in this person. And of course, what I did was I went straight past. (laughs) Because what do you do with that? I had never encountered anything like that before. But I started having these, I don't know, I can call it mystical experiences, I don't know, whatever you call it, but I started having these experiences more and more. And because where we live right now, it's a long story, but we're living in an apartment, we've sold up our home in the leafy suburbs of Melbourne, came to the inner city so we could be close to our church plant. Don't feel sorry for me, it's a great place where we live. (laughs) It's absolutely brilliant. But it's a really weird kind of suburb called Port Melbourne, South Melbourne. It's very eclectic, you've got yuppies down there, you've got high rises and then you've got people that are kind of asset rich and cash poor and then you've got people living in kind of government apartments and high rises all around the place and you've got a lot of homeless people. I live across this place where there's these multi-million dollar kind of terraced houses everywhere and then there's this park and you've got people that actually sleep in that park at night because they've got nowhere to go or they just can't stay inside because they've got all kinds of psychological issues and they just can't stay within confined spaces. They have to get outside and sleep out there at night. And so I can look from my apartment house and I can see a guy who's got all his worldly positions in in a trolley and he's just pushing that around everywhere. And so I often go to the park and I often see people that are sleeping there. And I've had these number of encounters where I walk through the park and I look at people that have been sleeping in that park or that are, for whatever reason, have got no work and they're just there on their own. And I see Jesus in them. It's, it's kind of like a personal thing to me. and it, it, It's actually hard to talk about it. And I said, Lord, what do I do? You know, what, what program can I do? That's the first thing. <laughs> what program? How can I fix this? Actually, there's a lot of programs already down there. Um, and the Lord said, well, just get to know them. Find out their name. Find out who they are. Just talk to them. Just encourage them. <laughs> so I, I started doing that. And uh, one day, uh, my, my wife, Robbie, bought me some, some Brooks uh, runners. And uh, I already had a... Um, some gym shoes, so I didn't wear them very much, you know. So, and one day I thought, oh, I'll, I'll put on these Brooks runners, you know. I haven't worn them for a while, brand new. And I go th- walking through the park, and there's this guy there whose his shoes are just all falling to p- apart, and his feet are on the ground, and he's pushing this trolley. And I just thought, I got new shoes. He's got no shoes. There's something in the Bible about this somewhere. I remember. <laughs> Um, and I had just come back from Malaysia, mind you, and I'd been speaking to some of our graduates that were working with uh, some really incredible marginalised communities and hearing their stories, and that was resonating in my mind as well. So the Lord said, go over and talk to him, and, you know, you give him your shoes and you take his shoes. And so I went over to the guy and found out his name, and you know, I'll call him Neil, that's not his real name, and, um, and he said, oh, yeah, I don't like those shoes. So we swapped and, and he went on his way. And now every time I see him, I, I know his name, I see him and we talk and so forth. And I walked home with his shoes, <laughs> which was really, really embarrassing. <laughs> if you know what I mean, I'm dressed up and I've got these kind of things that are flopping around like, you know. And uh, so they go straight to the bin. <laughs> There's another occasion when my wife and I were... Um, uh, it's, we've got a small church, right, 30 people. Um, and just, but most of the people that come to that church now come from the area, which is really, really great. And um, anyway, so because you've got a small church, sometimes you've got to do the banking of the money yourself. Yeah. Oh, I hate doing that kind of stuff. Anyway, so we, we jump on a tram and we're going to do some business in town and we had um, the church finances. And as we get into the tram, there's a guy who came up to us and said, have you got any money for breakfast? I really need breakfast. And uh, we, we had this cash, but it was the, the church offerings. And uh, I said, well, you can't give this. This is, this is the church offering. This has got to be properly processed, you know. You can't just hand out this money. This doesn't belong to us. This is, this is God, you know. But at the same time, you're feeling really bad because this guy needs breakfast, right? And so, you know, I said, oh, mate, sorry, we can't do anything for you. I just honestly don't have money to give to you, which was the truth. And so he said, oh, it's no worries. And he goes on his way and... 
we're going our way. And I'm feeling really, really bad, you know. And I said, Roy, let's pray. This is not good. So we prayed and we just prayed. said, God, help that guy, you know, whatever. Anyway, so we did our business and all the rest of it and did the banking and took out some of our own uh, cash. And on the way back, this is in Melbourne, right? A million people went smack bang into this guy. I said, thank you, God. Thank you, God. The opportunity to bless you, the opportunity to do something for you. I said, hey, I said, hey it's us. Said, hey, it was like a great big reunion, you know. So, <laughs> said, you know that breakfast you wanted? Yeah, do you still need it? Yeah. Here's a few dollars. Go and have, go and have breakfast. I mention all that. That's just, a, that's just a side note that God can speak to you in all kinds of different ways. He can. Anyway, back to the main message. How do we live successful lives? What's the secret? How do we know how to, how to treat people? How do we know how to resolve conflict? How do we run a business? How do we bring up our kids? How do we know what's true and what's wrong? How do we know what's true or fake news? <laughs> In the past two years, Rob and I have had the most extraordinary number of interactions, decisions that we've had to make in, in all of, of our lives. Moving home, I don't know about you, but for our age, moving home is a big deal. Selling up and tr- downsizing and then kind of planting a church and all this sort of stuff. It's been really stretching. I've got to be honest with you, it's been the most painful and stretching times of our lives, but also the most joyful. It's kind of this paradox of stuff happening. And, um, you know, we've moving to live in Port Melbourne, uh, we've had to make so many decisions, moving, renting a home and then moving into an apartment, buying off the plan, and so it involved hundreds of conversations, words with, and contracts and builders and real estate agents and lawyers and tradespeople and service people and electricians and plumbers and gas people and experts and air con and carpenters and blind installers and phone internet companies and TV and appliance and shop owners and furniture and cabinet makers and consultants and cleaners and lift operators and body corporate and managers and bath experts and banks and more... And at the same time, I was managing a complex kind of uh, partnership where our college was going to partnership. We were a fairly young college with one of the oldest institutions in Melbourne called Melbourne School of Theology, and we were partnering together. And that successfully, not quite a merger, but a partnership has happened. And we were going through that at the whole time. And then there's the church and family relationships and all this sort of stuff. And I want to tell you, I was stretched to the absolute limit and there were nights and I was coming home and there were words going around in my head that I hadn't, been, that I hadn't spoken since I was a, a young 20-year-old before I got saved. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not good words, <laughs> but my memory banks had remembered them. <laughs> and I'm muttering under my breath and all the rest of it. And I began to seek God about how do you successfully manage life when the pressure is really at its peak, when you're beyond your capacity. And I believe God has a solution to every situation, every conflict. And I want to tell you that dealing with, well, you would know, dealing with all different trades, people and banks and all that, not everyone is actually interested in doing the best for you. They're kind of interested in making their dollar, you know, and it involves conflict or potential conflict. And each one of these situations need to be resolved on a daily basis. I want to talk about the C or the, the secret or the key to navigating the complexities and the difficulties of daily life. And I believe that the secret and the key to it, and this is after 35 years of ministry and particularly this intensive time last two years, is found in the intersection and the interaction of grace and truth. The right balance of grace and truth. The dialogue and the discussion between grace and truth. They seem like two opposite qualities, don't they? The opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, you know, people sometimes say, you know, he's all truth, but he's no grace. He's got no grace. He's just all truth. Just tells you the truth, but there's no grace. in. It. Or she's all grace and love and all that, but there's no reality. There's no truth in her life. It's just all, it's all grace. And both of those can be extremes. 
And I believe that the success to everything in life is found in a correct intersection of the two together. And we see that quintessentially in the life of Jesus Christ. And I see it specifically, if I can look at John's Gospel again, John chapter 8 and the story of the woman caught in adultery. Most of you know, would know that story, but you know that the religious leaders brought this woman who was caught in adultery before Jesus, brought her, made her stand before the whole group, made her stand out in public and brought her sins out in front of everyone. It's interesting, isn't it, that the elite religious rulers, and remember in those days there's no difference between politics and religion. Yeah. They were the same thing. So these guys were the political leaders the religious leaders, and they brought this woman, made her stand before Jesus. They were trying to trap him and they made her stand before all the men. How embarrassing would that be? There was no Me Too movement in those days. And the law, they reminded Jesus, says that she must be stoned, she must be killed. Because the law was there to show people the that if you go into these areas of sin, it actually results in death. And there was a penalty, an ultimate death penalty, to try and control sin in the community, in life in those days. And they were trying to trap Jesus because they knew that he was into grace. And he was someone who was caught in adultery. And Jesus stooped and started to write on the ground. Do you remember that? The lead singer of uh, U2, Bono, said, yeah. I know why Jesus was doing that. He was an artist. (laughs) Well, yeah, maybe. He was writing something in the ground. We're not quite sure what it was. But he said, if one of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And it says, they all left. The oldest first to the youngest. I think because the oldest had been around for a while, you know, they had a bit of experience of life. They realized that they've got some stuff to deal with in their own lives. But the young ones were a bit more self-righteous, you know. They were still holding out until the end, but eventually they too left because they realised that they had stuff in their lives as well. And only Jesus and the woman was left. It's interesting. When he was riding in the ground, we're trying to think about what was he actually doing. It came at the end of a festival of tabernacles where for eight days the Israelites were celebrating how God provided for them in the desert when they came out of Egypt and they were going through the desert and how they, were, they found water in the desert and how Jesus is or how God is the life-giving water and they were celebrating that for eight days and they had all kinds of ceremonies around water that were celebrating this life and they, all the studies that they did around that Feast of Tabernacles came from the book of Jeremiah and one of the key verses in the book of Jeremiah 17 13 is this Lord you are the hope of Israel All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. And so Jesus, with one demonstration, without a word, actually communicates what they've been celebrating for eight days. And what he was doing was not only an act of grace to the woman, it was an act of truth and judgment on these political religious leaders that was condemning this woman what was he writing in the dust perhaps their names and then he and the woman were left alone and he turned to her and he said has no one condemned you and she said no one he said neither do i condemn you grace and then he said go and sin no more truth grace and truth together It's a perfect example. When you think about our culture, our Australian culture, when they think of the church, what do you, what springs to mind? They think of judgment. They they perceive us as being all full of law and truth and condemnation and you can't do this and you can't do that, rules and regulation and now hypocrisy. It's how they perceive us. It's unfair, but that's, how the, that's what the perception is. When you think of our culture, what's our culture's predominant values? It's grace, isn't it? Without truth. There's no such thing as sin. You can do whatever you like as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. <laughs> Not realising that every action that we undertake has an impact on someone else. I was listening to this a really interesting interview by a, a 30-year-old white male interviewer. And he was interviewing a millennial 
university student and they were talking about you know, being tolerant and all the rest of it. And he asked this question, he said, he said this is a 30-year-old male interviewer, he said, what if I told you I was a five-year-old Chinese girl? If I identify as a five-year-old Chinese girl, what would you say to me? And this millennial university student said, I would respect that. I would accept that. <laughs> See, that's grace without truth. I mean, I can have grace if you've had some kind of issues in your life and you've got this kind of problem in your thinking, or whatever, but that's not the truth of what's going on. And grace without truth can be as dangerous as truth without grace. I know it's a bold statement, but I believe the answer to every situation, every problem, every quandary, every issue in life, whether it's morals or social or political or business, is in the intersection of grace and truth. And it's found in a person, Jesus Christ, who's the embodiment of grace and truth. It's not just principles, it's a person. Problems in our family, problems in world relationships require a person's input of grace and truth. And the good news is that he is available, but he needs to be invited into those situations. For example, how, how do you discipline your kids? As something we've got parents we have to face all the time. How do you sort out a disagreement, a conflict with your, with your kids? Grace and truth. See, if it's all grace... And if it's just grace all the time, the kids will grow up self-indulgent and spoiled and self-centered and no resilience to deal with the hard realities of life and no respect for other people if they've just received grace and, you know, and there's no truth. But if you use just truth, harsh truth without love and acceptance, they'll grow up knowledgeable but resentful and harsh and unbending and, and lacking, lacking in sympathy and, and empathy for other people. Both need to be there together. How do we resolve issues between nations? How do we resolve the issue with North Korea or Vladimir Putin <laughs> and the West? Grace and truth. We need to respect their culture, respect the fact that their language, that they're a different race, love the people, treating them with dignity but not tolerating threats to destable world order. It's got to be grace and truth. And, and ultimately, to resolve these kind of issues in our world requires people that will embody grace and truth, a community of the followers of Jesus who embody that by showing people how to live successfully in life. It requires a community. It requires a community of people that will bring in the rule of God, the kingdom of God, the rule of God, showing how grace and truth operates in its intersection in every area of life. That's why the world needs the church, needs us yeah. as a community, the body of Christ. Because the local church, we are the embodiment of grace and truth in our world. And it shows the world how this is actually meant to work. It shows how the Spirit of Christ lives in real human beings. And it needs a body of people to actually get the full picture of what grace and truth is because none of us individually know how to get this grace and truth thing working together. We need one another. To get the right intersection of grace and truth, we need each other with our different gifts and our different abilities working together. And these things can seem quite opposite, can't they? Grace, truth just seem so different. Life is about change. Everyone say change. change. We don't like it, <laughs> but we need it. Just got to keep growing, got to keep developing. Whatever stage you are in life, you've just got to keep growing and pushing, even though it's hard, move to the next thing that God has for you. you know, take a new course, learn a new skill, pick up an instrument. Maybe start painting where you've always thought, you know, as a kid that you wanted to be an artist or you wanted to paint, but you never got the opportunity to do that. Well, maybe now is the opportunity, the time to do that. Life's about change. And God has led my, my wife and I through many changes from a safe rural Tasmania through to, you know, the inner city of Melbourne. Very different from living in a nice, safe rural place to the inner city of Melbourne. Um, through 
being church planters and church pastors and buying land and buildings and that to then going into academia and then going back into academia again and out into church planting again. It's, it's about change. Is following Jesus safe? No. <laughs> but is he good? Yes. He's always provided for us homes, being able to put our kids through private Christian education. How did that happen? I don't know. But he did. Holy Spirit is the best change manager there is. <laughs> In every major change, he's always threaded together a link, a chain that connects the past and the known and the secure to the unknown. There's always been a connection there to enable us to do it well. He's not safe, but man, he's good. There's always been blessing and joy and a sense of purpose in life. He's not safe, but he is good. And I think I've got a diagram up there somewhere. Grace all on its own is not Jesus. Truth all on its own is not Jesus. But grace and truth together, that's the picture of Jesus. And if we will invite him into every situation, every problem that you have, Whatever that may be, whether it's a family dispute, whether it's a relationship conflict, whether it's a business difference that you've got or a, or a job friction that you're going through, or maybe you need to resolve a real difficult political situation, I believe that the intersection of grace and truth will give you the way through. But he needs to be invited into that. This morning... I don't know where you're at. If you decide to follow Jesus this morning, will he be safe? No. I'm not going to tell you that. But is he good? Absolutely. Absolutely. Following Jesus Christ is the best thing you could ever do in life. And it has implications for eternity. Today I just want to put out a simple call to wherever you're at, whoever you are, to follow Jesus in every area of your life with grace and truth. If you've never begun this step today, it could be the beginning of the greatest adventure and the biggest challenge that you've ever had. And I want to challenge you, if you are a follower of Christ, to pick up that unresolved area, you know, that area that's kind of just nagging there in the background, that area that's unresolved, and invite grace and truth to come into that area of your life. To bring the lion and the lamb to guide you, his spirit to empower you to walk through this minefield of life <laughs> with grace and with truth. You won't always get it right, but Jesus will be there with you to show you where the right balance is. And there are some situations where you may need to revisit and say, you know what, we need to put a lot more grace into this. Or there may be other situations where you say, you know what, we need to actually bring some truth into this situation. And Christ will be there with you. Grace and truth intersected together. Can I pray for you today? Yeah. Father, I thank you that you are so good in sending Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to die on the cross for us, to show us that the centre of the universe, that the power of the universe is a lamb that was slain and now risen and also a lion. A lion and the lamb together. A picture of perfection. A picture of power in its right balance. Father, I, I pray today that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts and that you'd give us the courage to just open up the door to those areas that have unresolved to bring grace and truth in it.